Okay, so maybe it will be a bit harder now. Uh, after lunch, it's always a bit more difficult to to follow a class. I will try to make it. Lunch and no coffee. So. And no coffee, exactly. Um, so, okay, I think we arrived till this point. Um, so we saw, well, just a super quick uh, recap on the point where we were. Uh, we're analyzing the different um, blocks inside the transponder architecture, and we define that these two here in blue are what we understand as self attention, and the uh, purple one is what we call uh, cross attention. That the cross attention is mainly what we had before defined in the attention mechanism that we saw with the with the sequence to sequence model. <clears throat> And then we, we saw the intuition of self-attention that it's basically the new way we process sequences instead of recurrence. Uh, remember that we were uh, computing these um, queries, keys, and values for each uh, word at the input in our sequence. And this way, we were computing the attention weights. And with this, uh, doing the weighted sum, this way, obtaining a contextualized vector of each of the input <laughs> that we have. Um, and also, I think this was the last thing we did that we can parallelize all this computation and, and we don't have to do for each query independently. So we arrived at, at this point uh, where we know uh, the difference between self-attention and cross-attention. Um, so let's move on. Um, now we have to talk about normal attention and mask attention, okay? So the blue one here, this self-attention we had here is normal self-attention. So what we already know is enough, but this, um, I don't know if you see it, but this has this word mixed, I must, sorry, uh, before. So we need to define why this is must, okay? Um, so yeah, normal self-attention is basically if we are computing the context vector for, for this word here, uh, this is compared to all the words in the sequence. But must is not exactly this. Must, what it's doing is that it just allows self-attention to look at the same time step or to, pre to the previous ones. So it, it allows to pick information from words that are in the left side of the current one, okay? And why is this necessary? Um, so maybe I should give you a bit of background here. Remember that when we were using RNNs, when we were decoding, we were generating a new word every time. So we have this sense of, if we generate one word at a time, at a time, all the information that we have, it's the ones that we already generated. Okay. But here in the transformer, during training, we have the whole target sentence. We, we have it available. The thing is that we cannot allow self-attention to mix information from words that are in the right of each. I mean, I am a word in the middle of the sentence, so I cannot attend to words in my right side because these are words that have not been generated yet somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to restrict it. And I do it with this mass uh, attention. Um, so this is an example. No, we have this word so far. And I want to predict the next word after obi, which is orders. So there are no words here. Even that during training, I have them. Because during training, I have the target sentence. So I, I have it available, but I, I restrict the self-attention to not look there. Because at inference time, I won't have the filters on the right because it's generating license. Um, so this is what mass uh, self-attention does, just looking, just restricting this attention here. Um, how it is done with a very simple trick. Uh, before it, we had something like this. So this is a, a query for the first word and, <clears throat> and was compared with all the keys. So now imagine that we have this query for the second word and we don't want to look to these ones. We, we don't want to compare with these keys here. So we basically don't compute the dot product with these keys. We just put a minus infinity for a really small number here in order that when I apply the softmax, this just gets an, a zero. So if the softmax gets a zero, then somehow I'm, I'm getting this attention distribution here where the zeros basically are telling me to not take into account these words for this query. I don't know if is this clear? Yeah. OK. Um, but again, this is, uh, this is something that is parallelized, as I was telling you before. So we, we, are not, we are never in this scenario where we are 
computing it for every query at a time. We do everything in parallel, remember. So what we need to do is if we focus in this uh, uh, diagram of the of the self-attention, scheduled product attention, sorry, um, we have this mask optional that I mentioned before. Um, you you not always apply this. Um, it is just applied when you are doing mask self-attention. So what, what does it consist in? Um, so <clears throat> um, when, when I do this matrix multiplication and this scaling, what, what I'm getting here are something like the attention scores, which is what I have here. So it's this matrix with, uh, with all the queries and all the keys, okay? And what I want to do is to restrict the queries to don't be able to look at, at keys that are uh, in the right side. So what I do is um, apply this masking, which is the blue block here, which is basically a triangular mask where I put this minus infinitive in this triangular shape. So what, what it's doing, if you, if you check uh, example by example, so here I have, oh, it's super difficult. <laughs> and here I have the first query, the first word, and I will go. This is the first query. So um, it only allows to look at the first key. So to itself, the second query, so the, the second word can, can look at the first word and the second word and so on. This is what I get with this triangular shape here with this masking um, in, in such a way that then later when I apply the softmax, this minus infinitive becomes zeros. And these are basically, um, so, so this, this matrix that I have here are the attention weights. So this is the famous attention matrix that it tells me how it's mixed the information. So I restrict it in a, in a way that all these probabilities are zero. So this is restricting that the queries cannot look to, to future keys. Understood? Any question? Okay. So this is mass self-attention. Yeah. In the end, you are doing the, this is, these queries are the ones you are inferior, right? Or, uh, um, I mean, in this case, the mass communication, you are inferring the words. You know, saying, well, this is the word, then you guess the next one, the next one, the next one. You're doing that, right? Mm. Are you doing self attention with these words? Or... I don't fully get the question. Uh, <coughs> I go back here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What is each one of these? I mean, these words are associated with the words you are actually guessing, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, okay, no. Um, Okay, uh, I understand the, the question. Um, so there is a key part here that I haven't mentioned and I should have mentioned better. Um, that the input of the decoder are the, the outputs that I am expecting. So this is in training phase, okay? So during training, I have both the, the source and the target sentence. But if you see here, it's saying outputs shifted right. Okay, and the thing is that in the transformer, what I have at the at the input of the decoder are the is the target sentence, but I shift it right. Similarly to, and I will go back really far away <laughs> um, to the recurrent because maybe it was more obvious there. Um, so remember when we had this, we can understand the inputs of the transformer decoder the same way. Um, here, if you see what we have in the input of the decoder and in the output is the same sentence, but shifted right. So in each, in each position, I predict the next word. So when I have starts, a start of sentence token, I predict he. When I have he, I predict hit. When I have hit, I predict me. Okay, and this is what I have at the input of, is this something? Okay. Um, <clears throat> This is something that I also have in the transformer. So here in the transformer, where, where it says um, output shifted right. Where was I? This is output shifted right. This is output probabilities. Okay, this is more or less what I what I had now. Um, so regarding your question, the this restriction I do here is that at the output of that position, I will generate the next word, but I cannot allow the self-attention to, I just allow self-attention to look at itself and the previous ones. I don't know if- But if you do the whole matrix at the same time, 
why not use the, the, the next words as well? I mean, you, you have them, it means you are either guessing them or not. But, but I won't have them at inference time. So at inference time, we will see an example later. You don't use the whole metric. You can find it. Um, it works. Yeah, super nice question. Um, we, we have a slide later, and uh, okay. I will tell you um, of how it works at inference time. Because at inference time, the good thing about the transformer, I'm saying all, always that um, we can parallelize everything and it's super fast, but it's during training. During inference time, the decoder is not so efficient um, because we need to do the, like we were doing in recurrent neural networks, but we will see it later, okay? And maybe it, it clarifies better this. In general, in general now, take this idea that during training, we have the whole target sentence and that we have to put restrictions because at inference time, I won't have the whole sentence at, at the input of the decoder. Um, so, okay, it's time to go to, to the multi-head attention because until now we were speaking about uh, these self-attentions here, the masked one, the cross attention, but it, in all of them, in the figure, it's saying multi-head and we, we didn't care about this. So what is multi-head attention? Any guess what multi-head attention could be? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the intention. So we learn a way to um, give context to words, uh, learning some kinds of relations between words. Um, but why if we learn multiple of them? multiple kind of relations between words. Um, so that's what we do. In this case, for example, we have eight heads, eight attention heads. And we will learn in parallel eight uh, contextualized representations of these words that find different patterns. And I will give an example. Ah, it's too far away. No, what is it? This example. I think I should move this slide. Um, this is the intuition, OK? Um, this is what we had before, normal self-attention. We understood what means giving contextual representation to it in this sentence. But now we have something like this. So we have the same sentence, but all the colors that I have here are different heads. And each head can focus on finding different relations between words. So for example, the one that we had before is the, the orange one I have here, this column. But then maybe there is, um, so a good example is the green one here which is mainly focusing on tired. So it's another relation between words in the sentence that it's giving information to it, that it's a, an, ele a, an element of the sentence that is tired, okay? As we are now. Oh. Um, so <clears throat> so the, the idea is this one, that maybe a head can focus on trying to find um, the noun that pronouns are referring to, and other heads can focus on defining uh, which is the state of, of a subject in the, in the sentence, okay? And again, th this is not something that we force the network to do. This is something the network figures out that it's, it's useful to, to, do the, to, to solve the task, okay? There are also other examples that may not be uh, so evident as these ones that I choose. And maybe there are some heads that will not uh, carry useful information. But you see this idea of that I can learn different attention patterns, right? That, that they can focus on different stuff, different stuff. And how, how do I do it? Uh, now I will go back. Um, basically, if before I had a, um, a projection for queries, keys, and values, now I have different projections for every head I have. So I will generate queries, keys, and values triplets for as many heads I have. Okay, so in a way, I am the, the network will learn uh, how to generate these queries, keys, and values in different ways to to find different connections between them. You 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 understand what I mean? Yeah. Question there, and then. Is there any? Are we forcing the, the matrices for different heads to be different somehow? Or good question. And. Um, I, I am really enjoying to, to be doing this class in, in people that care about efficiency uh, <laughs> because the transformer sometimes looks like an architecture that was designed just yeah, yeah to I become mean, big and scale crazy and just yeah. put a lot of parameters. And th this has been, uh, there has been some research on that. Uh, there's people that 
found that there are many uh, attention heads that are um, basically doing the same or not giving uh, important information. There's a lot of work on pruning heads. So you train a, net a network and then you realize which is the networks that you can prune and remove and then get the same performance. Yeah. So yeah, re really nice question. Yeah. Um, but in general, it seems that giving the possibility to the network to exploit all these heads uh, is something useful that maybe then you can prune, but at training time, it's- It would be like in a convolution in the network where you're defining multiple filters, right? Yeah. If you're saying, okay, the different filters will be looking at different aspects of the inputs. Yeah. And you let the network learn it's on its own with what to put in the field. I mean, they hope that they are learning different features. And this is the same thing, but maybe they are not needed. I'm super happy because uh, I never thought about this example and I was teaching this class uh, a week ago and a student gave me this example and I said, yeah, totally true. Like it's the, exactly the same thing that we do with convolutional neural networks and all the filters that we have available. Yes. Most of them maybe no, are, are not useful. Uh, so th this is exactly the same. Um, but in general, you get the idea. Sorry, and there was a question. No, that was related to the complexity. Okay. It, but the, is, yeah. Okay, um, so we, we have, um, at, at the end, what we have is the, the same outputs that we had before, uh, that is the applying the scale dot product attention on the set of queries, keys, and values that I compute. So then I, I have this output eight times. So these are contextualized representation of these words, um, but mixing information in different ways. So I, I contextualize the words in eight different ways. Yeah. This might be a stupid question, actually, because before the break, I was wondering why we need the query and the key. Uh -huh. And my answer that I gave myself without checking it with you was that we need two different representations of, of the same input because we try to catch different correlations, right? As a matter of fact, you use the query when you compare one word with the other ones, and you use the key when you actually consider that word in comparison with another target. Mm -hmm. So the Q and, and query serve two different purposes. But mm -hmm. now that you, you introduce multiple matrices mm -hmm. that have basically the same objective, right? They try to capture different correlations among, let's call them correlation among the different words. So why do we still need Q and, and, and queries? Uh, sorry, queries and keys. Um, <clears throat> well, what, I mean, at least one of the two has to be different uh, because if we had the same projection for queries and keys, uh, we wouldn't have uh, different attention patterns. But it's true, and maybe that's an idea for a paper, it's that maybe we could have just a, a matrix to project to generate queries mm -hmm. and then projecting different keys depending on the head. Right. Maybe that would work. Uh, or the other way around. No, maybe right. we are doing too much stuff here. Oh. Uh, but I mean, what, what you cannot do is to have a single projection for queries and keys and apply them to all heads because then you will end up with the same attention matrix in all the in all the attentions. Um, wait, I, I, th there is an example later that we can we can focus on on this again um, because right. I, I think this will be more clear. Right, right. Fine. Um, I, I just wanted to mention that obviously we we are not happy with having all these outputs, so we want a, a single output that collects all this information. So what we do is we concatenate all this and we have another projection. This is a new one that, uh, that gives us uh, the original embedding dimension. So it, this, this learns how to mix all this information. Um, so at, at the end, what we have here are again, contextualized representation of these words, but that have passed through different um, mixing of information for the different heads in parallel, okay? So what we do here, we have uh, more detail, this is the concatenation of all the, the outputs of each head. And we multiply this by the, the WO matrix and we get the final representation. And the, this is the output of the, of the multi-head attention. This is the slide where I wanted to, to arrive um, to, to understand this concept that we need different queries, queries and keys. Um, so this is similar to a slide that we had before. We have the vectors uh, representing words here and we generate queries, keys, and values for one head. Queries, keys, and values for another head. 
And for the last one, queries, keys, and values for another head. So if we had the same uh, projection for generating queries, keys, and values, so sorry, um, first. So here we do the query key matrix projection and the softmax. And what we had here, what we have here are the attention weights for this first head. These are the attention weights for this second head and for the last one. So if we had the same projections for queries and keys, these matrices will be exactly the same. And that's precisely what we don't want. We want these matrices to be as much different as, as possible, to, to mix information in different ways. Okay. Um, and then, well, we multiply them with the values and, and so on. Also, another way, <laughs> now I'm thinking aloud, another way to, to remove some compute would be to maybe just use always the same value projection. Maybe that would be useful also um, because you learn different ways of mixing information, but then the, the project, the, the value is always the same. Yeah, that, I will definitely do some, some experiments on what you said. Um, so, <clears throat> so yeah, I, I, I like this uh, view of multi-head attention. This is what we already saw. And okay, there is a question. Just, uh, when, when you combine the different heads outputs, yeah, it's just it's a symmetric distribution. So, right, so you, yeah, I'm just not sure which, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see for which one of the and it's not really a pool, it's not really. No. It's just a match of multiplication of everything. Right? How I like to. Concatenation also, right? So we, we concatenate first. Oh, okay, yeah. um, so what we would have here uh, is um, a super long representation for each word. So the, the first row here would be the contextualization of the first word. But then we don't like that every head gives information so split it in this uh, in this vector representation. So basically, with this projection, we we learn how to mix this uh, information coming from diff different heads. And we, we end up with a unified uh, contextualized representation of the vectors. Yeah. Can you go to the previous slide? This one? Uh, yeah. Uh, is it a good idea to, to give like an importance between the output of each head? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, the Z1, the Z2, the Z3. Um, maybe because, um, like uh, Yasin said, uh, maybe the, the, the heads, they learn in like some very similar. Um, Something not not even useful. Maybe if we if we find like some solution to give more uh, some importance to some of the heads over the others. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't know. Just uh, asking if it's possible. If someone working on that or not. Really good question. Um, really happy that you asked. Um, because at the end, if if you if you think about it, uh, what this new matrix that it's learning while it's doing, it's mixing this information. So since this is learned. If there is a head that it's not giving a good enough representation, this matrix can learn how to remove this information. Um, because if we go here, uh, no, we multiply each row of this with each column of this. So this matrix can learn to put zeros to heads that are not good, if this is the case. And this will remove this information. And this is a waste of efficiency because you are adding. <clears throat> and add and then removing exactly so yeah yeah um well you could analyze this uh projection here and see if there are zeros in a specific head and say okay maybe yeah. this head is yeah um we are we are having super great day yesterday <laughs> <laughs> yeah question that Um, I'm not aware of any paper doing it, but I'm kind of sure that anyone has tried it. Um, I, I'm gonna, ch I'm gonna check it. Um, so maybe you can select maybe three heads. I don't know which is the number that normally you see. How many heads? <laughs> you can do. Maybe you can select two or three heads, let's say, and then you use our analyzing term. 
Totally yeah, makes sense. Do, maybe, it, it, it totally makes sense. It, this could, like, this is even easy to implement. Like, yeah, at, yeah, at yeah. some point, you have these matrices. You can measure somehow the similarity between yeah, them and, yeah. and add this as a, as a generalization. Or um, maybe, I don't know. Uh, about uh, about some metrics to measure the similarity between matrices. Maybe you can measure I don't know some cosine similarity between the results among the results of the matrices. So here, right? So yeah, cosine similarity between these yeah. representations. For example, yeah. Um, totally. The only problem maybe is that you have to be pairwise. Th this this could be done, um, but. Like probably someone has tried, and also yeah. I think that sometimes, like, yeah, easy to try, uh, seems obvious, but sometimes it's it's weird because we we try to add some common sense to the training of neural networks, and then when you try it, you find out that the network for some reason it finds useful to have this um, all all these available and yeah. to don't have the restrictions, but. I don't know. Yeah, it could be. It could be done. It's a. It's a good idea. Um, definitely. I mean, I, I say that probably there is a paper doing that because I think it's a good idea and it's kind of easy to to arrive to this conclusion. But yeah, good good catch there. Um, happy and I feel that you you're understanding the goods of multi head attention. <laughs> what else? Let's move on. Um. So we know about multi-head attention. Um, there are now a couple of, of layers that maybe are a bit more easy, um, but we want to define them also. So we have these blue boxes here that are circled in, in purple, which are feed forwards. So in general, if you know about deep learning, you probably can guess what these feed forward, forwards will be. Um, <clears throat> basically, it's a it's two projections feed forward layer with a with a uh, activation function in between, uh, a ReLU uh, function. And basically what we are doing here is uh, projecting normally, well, normally always it's projected to a higher dimension, each of the representations independently, then we apply the ReLU and then we go back to the previous uh, representation size. Um, it is important to understand that it's applied independently for each vector. So we, we don't have any mixing of information now between representations. It's like a way to further learn better representations of each word. Um, so we are giving more capacity to the model. Actually, it's also cool to, to see that we always heard about that deep learning needs non-linearities to, to unleash its, its power. And this is the only non-linearity that we've seen so far. I don't know if you realize. Um, but yeah, we, we have no mixing of information between words here. We are just modifying each one, uh, projecting, up projecting and down projecting. Uh, are these MRPs shared parameters or they are, are they different? Like for each token? No, it, it's each shared. So it's a, it's a single projection that it's applied the same for all of them. Yeah. Um, and we have here the formula. Um, so yeah, basically this W1 and B1 are corresponding to the up projection. Then with the max and zero, it's basically the ReLU. And then with this output, we can project back uh, with W2 and, and B2, which is the, the other down projection. Um, so I don't want to enter into details. This is a, I mean, in general, transformers have been here for a while. It's it's uh, technology for from five years ago already. But there's a lot of things that we already we still don't understand about transformers. So there's a lot of research on interpretability, and there are some very recent papers that analyzed which is the which is exactly the what are exactly these layers doing. Um, so they found that they can store like they they have like a memory where they store some concepts. So um, yeah, there, there is a place that they save concepts that the network can, can use. But I didn't want to add it in the slides because it, this is a quite recent topic that it's still being analyzed, okay? But it's important to, to understand that we still don't know exactly what this uh, part of the transformer um, is doing, simply that it works because it, it improves the transformer. <laughs> um, 
Also, I wanted to mention that these are projection normalities four times of the embedding dimension that we were using. Is typical numbers that are used. So normally here we have like uh, 512, and then we are project to 2048. Like typical transformer architecture. Then you can you can tweak it. So nice. I don't know if you realize, but we've seen many of these blogs already. Um, we already know now about feed forward networks. Uh, and you have escape connection there also. That's what we're going to do now. Okay. So now we go to add a norm. And as you said, uh, basically we have residual connections here. Residual connections are this, um, um, are this idea of adding to the output of a block the, what we had at the input. This was introduced in ResNets and seems to help in training because it helps the, the gradients better flow. So, but in general, get this idea um, that, that it helps training. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, there are some recent papers that analyze which is the impact of this residual connection in the specific task of the transformer. Um, so it seems that it's keeping information from the original token. So if we are in an encoder, for example, and we are contextualizing uh, vectors, think that if we always have the residual, residual connection that it's bypassing self-attention, for example, this is somehow keeping the original representation from the original work. But this is quite advanced topic, uh, so, some super recent uh, research field. Um, but yeah, basically that's what we are doing here with add. And then norm, the norm part comes uh, from this layer, norm layer. Um, which is a kind of uh, normalization, the typical that subtracts the mean and divide by the, the standard deviation. We also have some parameters here that are learned. They're, they are very few parameters, but I, I won't enter into details now. Yeah, and um, it's a bit difficult, a bit different of, of patch norm. Mm -hmm. um, I, I never remember exactly the difference. The thing with patch norm is that you compute the mean and the standard deviation with all the samples in a batch. And I think here it's it's independent for each sample in the batch. Um, there's a difference. But at, at the end, it's the same idea, like patch norm. It's, it's to improve trainability, to keep all the representations uh, in a controlled way to be normal. So when you're training, you will use the mini batch calculation mm -hmm. of the mean standard deviation for each mini batch. But when you're using the neural network, which is already trained, you're replacing with the mean and standard deviation for the whole whole. True. Data. That's true. What's the so I think, to, to be honest, I, I don't fully, don't exactly remember how a uh, layer map works, but I believe it's, I mean, during training, it's applied, you, you compute the mean uh, for each, for each, um, example in the batch independently. So then at inference time, it would be the same because that the thing with, yeah, I think that's the, that's the thing. I think that you compute for each example independently and then and then at inference time, you basically also compute the, the mean and the standard deviation for that single example you are, you are passing. Um, but I'm not fully sure to, to be honest. Um, uh, yeah, I, at least they cite the, the original paper of, of layer norm, so you can check the difference. Also, the, there is a super famous figure comparing, comparing batch norm, uh, instance norm, layer norm, yeah. which is pretty clear. I don't know. Yeah, I think, I think it's a paper related to group normalization. Yeah, Facebook. they have this. Uh, I, I think so. Yeah, the difference. Uh, but basically, it's just a dimension where you think the batch. Exactly. So channel rather than batch. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite easy to, to find exactly what, what this layer is doing. Um, but yeah, again, again, this is something that trains, uh, that improves uh, trainability of the network. Um, <clears throat> so we did practically everything from this figure. Uh, so just to check the multi heads attention we have here, the mask and the one that is not masked, both of them are self-attention. This multi head attention here, that is the cross attention. We also know now why is multi head attention. We've seen the feed forward layers, and we know now about the the add and norm. What else do you see there that still don't know what is about Position. positional encodings? Um, so, and this is one of my favorite parts about the transform. 
Um, why do we need this? Uh, because self-attention is super cool, um, but it's permutation invariant, okay? And, and this means that self-attention has no sense of ordering. What does it mean? Um, let me show you this example. We have this, <laughs> this sentence that we are using a lot because this is from Jay Alamar um, blog post. Um, so the, the sentence is saying thinking machines. That's not even a sentence because there, there is, a, there is no, no verb here. Um, these are the representations that I use to represent these words. Uh, this is a bit darker to be able to differentiate it. And when I apply uh, multi-head attention, I get the representation here. This is the contextual representation, the first row of thinking inside this sentence. The thing is that if I, if I um, permute it, if I change the order, and now I say machines thinking, you as a human understand that the meaning of the sentence has changed. Now I have a verb here. So before what I had is just um, machines is the, is the subject. No, I'm not a linguist. I don't know if you realize that it, so I, I'm struggling a bit with this. Um, but mach machine seems to be like a subject and thinking it's um, something that is defining this machine. So there's a, a machine that is it's able to think. While if I say machines thinking are machines that at this moment are thinking, okay? I mean, you can understand that it's not exactly not saying the same, but the, the problem is that when I contextualize it using self-attention, so here I, I switch it, so the representation of machines, now it's here, so at, at the input, it's exactly the same because I'm just representing independent words, but I want to contextualize in this sentence. So when I contextualize in the sentence, I, I should be able to capture somehow the, the, the difference um, that the, the word has in, in the current sentence. So if, if thinking changes the, the function in the word, the, the contextualized representation should be different because it, it's now acting as the main verb of the subject, while before it was like a modifier of the subject. Um, but the problem is that if I apply self-attention directly, um, I, I just get the same representations that I had before, but switch. And I, I don't know if you, if you see the problem here. So thinking is a good example. It has the exact same contextualized representation that I had before while it's totally different because the task in the sentence is different. The function that it's doing in the sentence is different, okay? Is, is this clear, the problem that it's supposed to? <laughs> I also want to open a, a small parenthesis here comparing to what we were doing before with RNMs. RNMs have an inherent sense of ordering because the, the way it's designed, I, I feed a new word at every time step. So if, if, if the representation I keep is the hidden state, the hidden state is updated at each new word that I feed. So the, the words are ordered. And if I feed two words to the recurrent neural network and, they, and then I feed them on the other way, the representation that they get is different because I, I, I feed it them in a different order. So this is something that it was inherent before with RNNs, but it's not in self-attention. So I have to do something with this, okay? And this is where positional encodings appear. Um, I like to say that positional encodings to me, uh, I don't know, this is a Spanish word. Uh, I don't know in English how it's said, but it's like a chapuza, something that, okay, it's a tweak that you do to solve a thing, but I mean, everything looks super nice. Self-attention seems like a great idea, also multi-head, but then you do this chapuza. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what are you doing here? So we have these vectors that represent words, remember? Okay, yeah. Um, and then you somehow add a vector that represents positions. So this vector here, it's a vector that represents position number one. This vector here is vector that represents position two. Nothing else, just position, okay? So basically what I do is adding this vector. So I add the vector representing the word G with the vector representing position one. And what I have here, what I have at the input, is a vector representing the word j in the first position. Sorry, so the yeah. vectors representing position do not depend on the input. No, right? no, just the position. The same. Yeah. But are they learned by the... the, the um, what I'm going to explain today, no, but it can be learned, but it's easier for me to... To say no. Okay. To say no, exactly, because this is the original approach from the okay. platform. Okay. Today they are... Nowadays they are um, learned position encodings, but I think it's easier to understand like they are. Random, but 
vectors, right? But fixed for each position, different for each Exactly. Position. Now, now we will see how we compute them. Um, but yeah, that, that's the idea. Correct. Um, so a, a good example to fully understand this is imagine okay. that in the example we had before uh, with the word eat, that by itself doesn't have many meaning. Imagine a long sentence where you have two times that eat appears there, and both of them are referring to different nouns. And self-attention has to, I mean, to make the system work, have to figure out which is the noun that that pronoun is referring to. If you, if you don't do this trick, um, both eat representations are the same at the input of the, of the network. And then when you compute self-attention, the outputs that they get are exactly the same. This is a bit mind blowing, but this have, I mean, they are in a totally different mode, um, um, place in the sentence and they refer to different things. But if you, you don't that positional information, the contextualization they do end up with a, the same contextualized vector at the end. Yeah. Um, so when you add position, they, they can understand that they are not exactly the same because they are in different parts of the sentence. And also um, they can, for example, figure out which are the words that are closer to each one. They have this information of which is, are words that are closer to them. And then they can use it in self-attention to, to extract these uh, representations. So how, how do we compute them? Um, at least in the original paper, something really simple. Uh, we have this equation that computes fixed uh, position encodings uh, using sinusoids. And we end up with this matrix. So we have here in the x-axis, Position. So this one here is the vector representing position one, this position number two, and so on. And, and this is the embedding dimension. So is, this is the size that that we choose to represent vectors in, in the inputs. So sorry, if it's not clear. So here, for example, we choose to represent words with vectors of size four. So we have to generate positional encodings with vectors of size four also. So this is this what this embedding dimension means. Um, so what do we do with this? Uh, if we have these three words <clears throat> and we want to add position encoding, we just pick the, the three first, first columns here. And these are the vectors that we use and we add them here. And this is the chapuza we do. With this, we solve the thing. There, there is also something interesting. I mean, this is, <laughs> I mean, the, the transformer authors are super good. I don't want to, <laughs> to say this is a booth and go away. I think there are great ideas here. Um, I think that using these sinusoids, if, if you if you take a look at this, um, this allows the model to find in different dimensions, um, how to say this, different, di different distances. So for example, all these, all these positions here from this, from this dimension to up, they are all represented the same. While in, in, if you just look the first dimension, there is a difference in each position. So depending on the, on the dimension you are looking at, you can find um, different granularities of distances between words. So it's, it's well designed. I mean, it's not something random as we were saying before. It, they, they thought about it, uh, they designed it this way with the sinusoids and so on to to have these possibilities. Yeah. Was it clear? Yeah. The, the word embedding is also uh, not uh, permutation invariant. Uh, sorry, if I have a word, uh, it's uh, the embedding is uh, a vector. Mm -hmm. You cannot permute the, the dimensions in the. the It changed totally because all, all the projections we have inside the network, um, you, you cannot permute them. Like if, if you just change the dimension, the projections do different stuff. Um, so it's permutation invariant, the self-attention in the sequence length dimension, but not in the embedding dimension, you cannot change anything here. Um, more questions about this, or we can understand that it's understood. Don? So I have good news. Uh, we've seen all the blocks already. Um, so I think you have an idea of all the blocks we see in the figure. I just, before I was saying to someone about how it works at inference time and that it's different of what we have at training, here we have an example. So first we can compute basically all the 
outputs of the encoders. So something that I want you to, to have clear is that, um, okay, we, we have the inputs, we have the, the embeddings, then we add the position encoding. So we have embeddings with time signal for each word. And we, when we pass through multiple encoder layers, as much as we design, we have these representations here that are the context, contextualized representations of these outputs. So then these will be used by the decoder through the cross attention that we learned. And now we are not at a training phase, we are at inference time. So what we do is we start with a, well, here it's not depicted. So it starts with I, imagine this is a begin of sentence token. So I pass it through the decoder, I generate the second word, I put it again at the input and I pass to the decoder multiple times. So at inference time, I have to do this autoregressively. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. while in training, I can fit all the target sentence at a time. And this is an improvement in efficiency. But now I have to pass multiple times. Um, yeah, is this clear? Okay. And for the state variable, you are using the same uh, input. So the input from the encoder, you know what I mean? Uh, exactly. Exactly. That that's something. Yeah. So yeah, super good question. Um. So once you once you compute this, this is already done at the inference time. The same state will be exactly attenuated every time. Exactly. We pass through the cross attention, and it's always the same. It's always the same. Remember that this cross attention will figure out which are the representations here that are more useful um, um, to, to, to that uh, decoding step specifically. The cross attention will be looking at so you have the whole information for the whole sentence condensed, and with the cross attention, you'll be basically every time you're picking what you need. Yeah, exactly. You, you pick which of the representations are the more useful. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I also wanted to to um, make you think of something. Um, when, when we talk about uh, cross-attention, for example, uh, we say, okay, yeah, um, so this has to focus on the word uh, Etudian to generate a student, for example. But if you realize what it's doing is actually looking at the outputs of the encoder. And we have something here, which is self-attention that already contextualized this. So this is somehow, it's not just picking information from Etudian. It's picking a contextual representation of this word. So it's it's also mixing information from all other words. It's simply that this representation is somehow more related to Edudian than any other one. Sorry for the pronunciation in French. Um, yeah, understood. Um, <clears throat> here we have another uh, more visual representation. We have the source uh, sentence here. We are doing self-attention here multiple layers, another layer, we do self-attention and we get this, these are the encoder outputs. And then when we decode, begin of sentence token and ah, it's not seen, not properly seen. Yeah, this is self-attention and there should be another one here coming from cross-attention, but I don't know why it's not visualized properly. Um, anyway, the idea is that you do both self-attention and, and check that we always do self-attention from left to right because we are in the decoding. Let, let's see again. So when, when we do self-attention in the encoding, we do, now it's done everyone at the time, but now in the second layer, you see that we do all the connections between them. So we mix information, all of them with all of them. Uh, but now, okay, now I'm picking information. It's not simple, but I'm picking information from the encoders. And then it's just in this direction. And picking also, and this is picking information in this direction. This is the intuition that we had before with uh, with a mass uh, self attention that we we <laughs> we have to generate uh, in a in a in this direction in the decoder. And finally, uh, to close the transformer architecture. Um, before in a break, I was talking uh, with someone about um, the interpretability that gives us uh, the attention mechanism, and now we did it even more crazy because everything in the network is self-attention and cross-attention. So we can analyze everything that the network is doing. So um, there, there are people that did, yeah, developing these visualization tools where you can just select one layer, one head, and understand how that head at that layer is mixing information. Um, you can, yeah. But th there is also a lot of research in that because, well, there's people claiming um, that this is not exactly what is happening in the transformer. This is quite more advanced topic. 
The idea is that we can analyze, analyze how attention is mixing information. Yeah, this can be, it may be improved by understanding of the language, how the language is related and you translate it from one language to another. Exactly. Actually, I was involved in a project in a group that there is a colleague of mine that is working on the PhD title is Interpretability on, of Neural Machine Translation. He proved that this kind of visualization are not the best way to do that. Um, we developed a, a way to, to understand how the transform, transformer is um, doing the mixing of information end to end. Like exactly which is the information coming from every input word that we have. And some of the things that we found is that uh, how the transformer is using, for example, the punctuation signs. So we, we are talking about mixing information of words, but then what happens with punctuation uh, marks? And um, so we found that the transformer is doing some tricks with that representations because there is no mean, meaningful representation that we can store them. So the, the transformer does some tricks to store other kinds of information there. And yeah, another, Nice takeaways that we had in, in that uh, in that paper. Um, yeah, but in general, um, I think that having everything based on attention allows us to understand how these models work. So we open the black box somehow. Okay, we finished the transformer. I think all the technical stuff it's already done. Um, we will go more practical now. Um, and until now, we just talked about uh, machine translation. Yeah, about the hour. At what time did we start an hour ago? Yeah. Okay, yes. I speak a lot. Okay. okay. Um, so now we are starting to go away from machine translation and see other natural language processing tasks first. And especially what, what I want to see you now, I will show the next slide, this one, that we don't need to use a whole transformer. Uh, we can, and we, we will show some examples, we can use part of, of it. And this also works and there has been many systems that have been designed this way. Um, so I like this classification, um, maybe, a, too simplistic, but I think it works to, to explain this part, which is encoder-only transformers, decoder-only transformers, and transformers uh, based on encoder-decoder. But I, I won't explain that part. I don't want to confuse you. I will focus on encoder-only and decoder-only. And the main models that have been proposed in this are BERT and GPT. Okay, and from them, I will explain everything. So I will start with encoder-only transformers. This is BERT. Has anyone heard about BERT? Well, this is something nice. Um, so what's the cool thing about BERT? Um, that it was the first time um, that, that somehow <clears throat> these models were, we, we democ democ democratized um, the use of these huge models. Uh, why? Because it was the first time that for an NLP task, um, it was used this approach of um, pre-training with self-supervision and fine-tuning on downstream tasks. Have you heard about self-supervision? Mm, no? Okay. So in general, to train neural networks, we need huge amount of data. Um, this is something that we know. And to train normally than our networks, we need um, data with labels, which is what is really hard to collect. So th there has been a lot of, of um, proposals in the recent years where we try to, to initialize the networks by learning without labels. So we just have, imagine now we are, we are dealing with text. So we have a lot of text, but we have no labels for it. So we try to learn from it to, to train a model to understand language somehow, and then use it to be fine-tuned on, on our own task based on this, um, on this pre-training that we have. And this, this started with, I mean, this is something that has been in computer vision some, for some years, but it started in the NLP field with BERT. And basically the, the idea is that we have a pre-training stage that the cool thing is that it's something that can be done by a huge company with a lot of resources. Uh, and then if they release it, 
uh, we can do the fine tuning stage where we um, fine tune on our own task, for example, in, in question answering task, and we have some data on it. We can initialize our model with these pre-trained pre weights and then um, fine tune it for our own task with, with less amount of data. So I will explain how they train this uh, BERT model. And yeah, maybe, I don't know. I, I know this is a quite different topic than yours, but maybe you can get some ideas on how to pre-train, how, how to do this two-stage training of pre-training and then fine tuning with label data. data. Sorry? Not that far. Not that far, okay. Um, so remember, BERT is an encoder only. So we basically have, remember the structure of a transformer encoder layer. So we basically stack many of these layers and this is how we design BERT. Um, and for pre-train, they, they mainly used uh, two tasks without any labels, which are, the first one is the, the masking one. So you have here text. I'm so sorry because um, it's not seen really clearly, but you have here some text, random text um, from, from a book, for example. And what you do is you randomly put a mask. Well, you, you, put, you randomly put masks on 15% of the tokens in the sentence. So you mask it, you pass it through a transformer and you train the transformer to predict which was the word, the word that was behind that mask. So you, you don't have any labels here. You have just a lot of text and you do this masking trick to, this way we, we show the, the model how language works. So if it's, it's, if it's able to predict what is behind the mask, it will understand better language and then it will, be, it will uh, work better in, in our own tasks. Um, <clears throat> then there is this other task uh, where they, um, you, you, have, yeah, you have a whole book or a whole library of books um, and then you can select two sentences that are contiguous or two sentences that are not, that are not contiguous. And you, you train BERT in order to predict if they are contiguous or not. Basically, this is a trick to also understand if two sentences um, are related or not. But again, this is unsupervised. We just figure out these labels. Um, so how we can use BERT? How does this fine tuning uh, stage works? So imagine we want to develop a spam, uh, spam filter and, and we have here some text from an email and we want to classify if it's spam or not. So we can download BERT, the pre-trained weight of BERT. Um, and we basically add uh, a classifier on top of it. So BERT gives us, can give us a representation of the whole sentence. Uh, and then we basically classify that uh, representation and we, and we can, yeah, and we, we can classify it in, in spam or not spam. Um, so you can basically freeze BERT if you don't want, you, can, you, you don't need even to train, to retrain BERT. You just pick this representation and train this classifier. Or maybe if you have enough data, you can also fine tune a bit BERT. But the, the cool thing is that you have a huge model here that has been trained by someone else, probably a huge company, and you can exploit that for your own task. Okay, so that's, that's why I was talking about democratizing um, this kind of, of models. Um, yeah, some details on how it is done. Um, to do sentence classification, you use the output of this first, uh, first word here, the special classification token, and then add a um, multi-layer perceptron here to classify. And here I have some examples also of, for example, how, um, how Google improved the, the search engine thanks to BERT. BERT is from Google and they, they really quickly applied it to the, to the search engine. So uh, it's, it's not clear here, but basically um, they, they tried with uh, two kinds of, of search. The first one says, can you get medicine for someone pharmacy? So he's asking if someone else can go to the pharmacy and, and get a, a, a medicine for you. So before BERT, it was giving the results of getting a prescription field, Medline Plus Medical Encyclopedia, nothing related. But then after applying BERT, can a parent have, or uh, can, a, can a patient have a friend or family member pick up a, a prescription? So it's way more accurate, thanks to applying BERT in this, in this engine. And there is another example there that I, that I will skip. So BERT is not only to do sentence classification, you can do also word level classification. Imagine you want to classify uh, each word, if it's a noun or it's a verb or whatever, 
You can also do it by fine tuning Bert, since you have um, you have outputs representing the contextualized representation of each word. Um, but they, I, I won't enter more into details on this. Um, but th this is the idea, right? We have this encoder-based transformer that it's pre-trained, and we can we can use it on our own tasks. Is this clear? Okay. Um, so until now, we, we just spoke uh, about BERT and we assumed, I don't know which language what you're assuming it's working on. Uh, so it was trained in English uh, text. But then there were a lot of research, uh, a lot of research uh, groups that started developing their own BERT models. Yeah, the most funny one is Camembert for, for friends and, and so on. So yeah, there, there were a lot of them at the end. This ended up with uh, Embert, which is the multilingual word. They basically collected text for multiple languages, and then you have the same that can be applied for multiple languages. Um, and then also, um, and as, as yeah, the researchers like these kind of funny names. Um, so from from that point, uh, there has been other models proposed under the same idea, so same encoder only uh, structure. Um, similar ways of pre-training it, but theoretically these improved um, the results. So Roberta, XLM, XLMR are uh, evolutions of this original idea from BERT. And if you are a bit overwhelmed of all these models for different languages, for different kinds of pre-training, there is this super nice website called uh, BERT Lang Street. Uh, yeah, there was a time that researchers like a lot of uh, Sesame Street uh, characters, so they started putting Big Bird, uh, Elmo, and all these kind of funny names. Um, so yeah, you have this website where you can find for your language different kinds of free train models, etc. And now let's move on to decoder only transformer. Uh, so who has heard about GPT-3? And this is a pretty famous one, right? So we are going to now understand how GPT-3 works, basically. Okay. Hope you are you are motivated with this. So what we have in GPT models is a decoder only transformer. So we remove the encoder now and we just focus on the decoder. And there is also another difference. I don't know if someone spots it. So we don't directly pick a decoder. It, we, we need to do a change in the decoder of the transformer. Someone sees it? The cross attention, correct. So we don't have any transformer encoder now. Remember before, after the mask, uh, multi-head attention, we had a, a cross attention here and then the fit forward. We, we had three blocks in each layer. So we, we remove it now because we, we don't have any encoder, so we don't have any cross attention to do. So we remove this block, but in general, the rest is, is a transformer decoder. Why? Because we also use this masking here. And what are we going to use this for? To generate synthetic text. So we basically will train this on the language model task, which consists on um, trying to predict the next word in a sentence. I give a sentence, I try to predict the next word. And this way, if I do this iteratively, I can generate uh, synthetic text. Here we have an example, robot must obi, and it generates the next word, which is orders. The difference respect them, with respect to them before is that we don't have any conditioning coming from the encoder, from the source sentence. It's just this sentence I'm trying to Field out next words. Okay. This is exactly what you saw from GPT 3, right? We will see. Yeah. So you will do programming and it, it, this is suggesting the next uh, yeah. common. This is also this. Um, we, we'll see it later. They're using this one, right? Yeah. Um, so this is what we are doing. This is an example of GPT-3. So if talking about efficiency, GPT-3 has 96 layers. So there's a lot of computation there. <laughs> um, and basically, yes, here we see how it predicts the next words and can start generating text from this point. Um, this was the first time OpenAI proposed a GPT model. And then GPT-2 came, which is the, one, the first one that started to become uh, quite popular. And then GPT-3 that exploded and it's the whole internet talking about GPT-3. So how is it trained? Again, this is unlabeled data. So you have raw text 
tons of it. You can basically download the whole internet as text and train a model to predict the next word. That's all they do, okay? But you can do it with the whole internet. So they are using a data set of 300 billion tokens of text. And the objective is predicting the next word, that's all. And this is how they get GPT-3. We will see later why uh, GPT-3 is so cool. Um, these, these are some examples that they have in the paper of generating uh, synthetic speech. Specifically, they are putting, um, they are generating like newspaper articles. So they give a title, a subtitle, and they write article uh, column, and then the model writes what it's in, in black. All this is artificially made up by GPT-3. Yeah. Um, so these are two examples. Um, they give like a very good example, a not so good example. They did uh, an experiment there where they asked humans to classify uh, the articles, whether if they were generated by a machine or whether if they were generated by, by a real newspaper. Um, and this one get a super bad accuracy on human classification. So this is something that seems really real. And this one's got 61% uh, of accuracy. So it's, it's more easy to guess if it's fake or not. But yeah, in, in a moment that we hear a lot about fake news and this kind of stuff, uh, you, you see the, how, how powerful is this, okay? Um, also, well, this was, uh, this was quite popular in, in the social networks. Uh, there was this post in Reddit where someone was saying that he or she was doing the homework with artificial intelligence, probably GPT-3, and that it's getting excellent uh, results. Also, he was getting uh, $100 profit by doing homework for other people. <laughs> and the, the cool thing about it was that the MIT answered to, to this, uh, so, so I said, Akit on Reddit says he uses OpenAI to get A's on his homework. When asked on ethics, the same AI responds below. So they asked OpenAI to, to develop on this idea of doing the homework with, um, with OpenAI. And, and the answer is quite good if you, you, if you have time to read it. Yeah, this is GPT-3. So they asked, uh, explain the moral and social issues with using AI to do your homework. And this is what GPT-3 generates. Uh, yeah. There are a few potential moral and social issues with using AI to do your homework. First, if students are using AI to do their homework, for them, they may not be learning the material as well as they could be. This could lead to problems, blah, 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 blah. So th this was quite popular. Um, again, as happened with BERT, uh, we started with GPT, GPT-2, GPT-3, and then a lot of other uh, new systems uh, came. This is from January uh, 2022. So this is really recent. Uh, then MTNLG, this gopher is from DeepMind. This is from um, Microsoft, February 2022. Uh, this is Palm from Google. This is the largest one as we will see now, April 2022. So this is something that it's really hitting hard now. Um, and with this, and I don't know if you realize from the, the title, um, people start talking about something new, which is, which is large language models, okay? I don't know, has someone heard about this concept? Large language models? Yeah. Uh, we will see some uh, of, the, of the power of these large language models. Just to put in context, this is GPT-3, which is the one that became super famous. This is the size in terms of parameters. Also GPT-2, that was the previous one that also <laughs> was so, so popular, is this tiny, Dot here and bear that we discussed a lot a lot is this one here so it's using 340 uh, million parameters while gpt3 is 175 billion parameters but now we are we are already here so we are talking about 540 billion parameters with palm okay and yeah super nice slide to expose to some people that are working on efficiency <laughs> actually we just checked that we, we often refer to this type of model to, to say the, how much energy is consumed oh. So yeah, the, the typical yeah. thing that we say the five time life emission of a car these are the guys that are like <laughs> yeah. 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 because this is not just this is not just training just i get some hyperparameters for the network and i train it it's a lot of iteration so it's yeah. trial and error train different so it's it's training a lot of hours to develop one of these models yeah. um so 
<clears throat> you know, there, there is this Moore law that was valid for so many years. Um, I think it's that theoretically every two years, the number of transistors you can put in a chip is also doubled. Um, or something like this, I, or every year, I don't remember. So, so someone, some people is, is guessing if maybe we are in front of a new Moore's law. Uh, because the thing is that every year now, we are multiplying by 10 the size of our models. Okay, so this is crazy how, how this field is, is, um, is growing these days. And, okay, and why do you think it's so important? I mean, if we go back here, uh, we saw some text generated by GPT-3, why do still, why do we still need to scale these models and make them even larger? I ask you to people working on efficiency. Does this make sense? Do we still need uh, as good um, synthetic text? What is the point of everything? So yeah, I'm gonna show you that there is a reason and this is why we talk about large language models. And it's because they are developing uh, new capabilities. So remember, we are training models by just predicting the next word. We just download the whole internet and train the model to predict the next word. That's all we do, okay? But with GPT-3, they realized that they could do other stuff, not, not just generating synthetic text. They realized that, okay, if they gave um, two examples of uh, sums, so two plus three equal five, uh, three plus four equals seven. Imagine I fail. <laughs> and so you give two examples and then you give another one and you end up with an equal and you ask the model to continue that sequence. The model was answering right the, the sum, okay? So they realized that, okay, maybe it's not just about generating synthetic text. There are also new capabilities that these models are, are developing by just reading the whole internet seven times, I think. And when they started scaling these models to even more parameters, there were other tasks that, that arise. So these models, for example, we, we've been talking a lot about machine translation. We have specific models trained on machine translation, but they realized that with these models, they can do translation. So if, if you just prompt uh, English uh, colon, and then you put a sentence Catalan and, and prompt the, the model to continue that sentence, it will generate the translated sentence in Catalan. Um, and this is one example. Uh, these models also can, you, you can prompt them to do uh, summarization, to do code completion as we, will do, we were saying before. So again, by just reading the whole inter internet and being trained to predict the next word, they develop all these capabilities. So, that, so, so yeah, there is a, a point uh, for now to, to still keep working on this kind of models at, at this point. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Even some models, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if they're using the degree of CPU, but, but they, they want even to, to like design a model that explains scientific paper. Yeah, this was. Even, even like you, you write you know, a question, you, you put the question, you want to give you like the whole answer yeah. about what is going on. But the cool thing is that the, the usual approach for this would have been to, to generate label data to do that. So to, to have a lot of papers with explanations of, of things and then training a model to do this. But they are not doing this nowadays. They have a, a huge large language model um, that you can, you can prompt it to, to generate this explanation of, of papers. This is something that it's, it has a huge power. Um, you, you, did I was clear with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were talking about like for fine tuning, you need to do data. That's if you don't fine tune. In, in this case, you don't even need to fine tune. Just sometimes you need to give an example of how it works. So you you yeah. In this case, for example, you you prompt the model with okay, this is what I'm going to ask you. So they prompt. Um, this is what it's called prompt engineering. I don't know if you heard <laughs> that nowadays. This also applies for models like DALI. This is, this is prompt engineering. And you basically um, give an example on, yeah, this is a paper, this is the explanation. Then I give a new paper and please tell me the explanation. And, and with this single example, the model understands what uh, it has to do. A model that ha just has been trained by reading the whole internet. Again, okay. 
Um, here I have some examples that I find them super mind blowing. Um, this is Chinchilla, another one of these models. Um, actually, this is called Training Compute Optimal Large Language Model. So they, they cared a bit about uh, the size of this model, these people. This is DeepMind. And it's not super okay. But in this case, well, they designed a, a way to interact with the model in a chat uh, way. And the user was asking, let's play a game. I give you two concepts and you tell me how they are connected. And the model answers, sounds fun. A, croissants, B, Renault cars. I'm not sure about that one, but the answer is the word France. Next, correct, let's try another. A, love, B, pain. The answer is the word heartbreak. A, the movie Inception, B, the movie The Matrix. The answer is the word mind bending. Okay, so the, the model is figuring out, figuring out how to how to find these, these um, analysis between words, okay? These connections between words. And yeah, there, there are other examples. If I share this, the slides, you can, you can better check them. Here it's, it's writing poems. So as I was saying now, the user in this case gives an example of a poem, and then it says, now your, your turn, use my template, template and write a poem about the cosmic significance of humanity. And the model writes a poem about the cosmic significance of humanity and other things, okay? Um, here there are, the Palm is the, the craziest one nowadays. Uh, it's the largest and with the more, more crazy capabilities, in my opinion. So here are some examples. Uh, maybe you can check it offline because they are, they are crazy. The one that I like uh, the most is this one, which is explaining a joke. It was the first time that I, I said, okay, this, uh, this is quite crazy. Um, so you, you prompt the model uh, saying, explain this joke, and you describe the joke. Did you see that Google just hired an eloquent whale for their TPU team? It showed them how to communicate between two different pods. I, I don't even understand the, the joke because I, I never worked with TPUs and I don't know enough English to understand that pods are also something related to whales. Uh, but, but then the model answered, TPUs are a type of computer chip that Google uses for deep learning. A pod is a group of TPUs. A pod is also a group of whales. The joke is that the whale is able to communicate between two groups of whales, but the speaker is pretending that the whale is able to communicate between two groups of TPUs. And this is the answer of the model, okay? <laughs> I don't know if you get the, the idea of the point that we are arriving nowadays with these large language models. <laughs> <laughs> so, so actually, the, there was an example uh, in, in the last weeks. Uh, they developed a model uh, to to write scientific papers, scientific publications. But they they retired the demo because there there was a lot of, of um, people complaining that the the claims that I mean that the um, publications that it was generating sounded so realistic, but it, it was not right. I mean, the, the content was the content was not uh, correct. But it sounded right because it it, it matched the way of, of um, explaining ideas by scientists. It, so it, it it seems so sure about what it's saying, but but it was not correct. So they they removed it, re removed the demo from online. But yeah, maybe in, in, in a year or so we, we will have again a model like this that will write so good. <laughs> but this, I think this will happen, to be honest. I mean, you, you describe this briefly, briefly your experiments and it will be able to find some citations and, and write an introduction. This will happen. <laughs> okay. Um, so we arrived to the last part of this talk. Um, so we've seen um, that we could go beyond machine translation, but we just stick to, to the NLP, to processing text. But this is not just about text, and basically transformers are everywhere, okay? And I will show you now some examples of uh, important breakthroughs that we've, that we've uh, seen in the last uh, months and years that are also, also based on, on transformers. Um, <clears throat> so Xavi, um, Xavi here is, uh, a teacher I had in the master, 
also a colleague now. Uh, we are teaching some classes uh, together in the postgraduate course that we do in the UPC school. And I remember when I was a student of his class, he was using this slide uh, to show that neural networks are like the real to the, the ring to rule them all. Like you, you can rule all, all these modalities with neural networks. But I evolved this slide and I think that it's a transformer that is the ring to rule them all. Okay, we can, it's not just about text, it's all the modalities can be uh, processed with the transformer. Um, so I, I start hard. So I, I remove se sequences. We don't even need sequences nowadays uh, to work with transformers. So in this case, they did simple image classification with a transformer. How they do it? Um, so it's just a transformer encoder, and they use this representation, the one, the same one that we were using in BERT to classify sentences. They use it to classify uh, images. And the way they fit the transformer encoder, it's a bit tricky, but they just build these patches. So they, they split the images in patches and they fit it as, as if it was a sequence. And what they do here, it's the position encoding, remember? Uh -huh. So they have position encodings for each position in the, in the image. Here we have a, a nicer visualization. They split it, they extract some representations. These are the position encodings fit to the transformer encoder and then use the representation to classify. So you can use transformers to, to do image classification. This is um, a model called VIT, visual transformer. Um, if we go to a um, more complex task in, in computer vision, we have this object detection task where you don't only want to classify the whole image, you want to, to draw bounding boxes and to classify what is in the bounding box. Um, so Meta proposed this paper uh, where, again, transformer encoder, transformer decoder, we already know what is this, what we see here. Um, and yeah, they have the image at the input and uh, at the end, they are trying to predict these uh, boxes and the class that is inside the blocks. Uh, so here they, they, they are predicting these boxes here and the class bird probably. Um, and again, the structure that we see is a transformer encoder decoder. Um, in the task of automatic speech recognition, which is just I, I feed a piece of speech and I try to, to generate the transcription of it, um, the transformer has been applied for some years now. Uh, it was one of the first tasks uh, beyond natural language processing or processing of text that, that succeeded, that applied the transformer uh, with success. Um, but recently, uh, OpenAI uh, released this model, which is open source, which is called Whisper. So take a look at it if you have time. Um, and this has been pretty popular because um, this showed a, a super good performance compared to the systems for speech recognition that we, that we had until now. So it is super robust. To, to noise, it's robust also to um, corrections in, in speech. Now I, I said M, for example. So it, it is able to remove these things that previous speech recognition systems uh, wrote this kind of, of things in the transcript. Um, and, and the cool thing is again that it's based on a transformer encoder decoder as the one we, we saw. Basically, to train this, they, they did some tricks here. So the, the tricky part is here. But they process the, the spectrogram with a transformer and they, they apply the transformer decoder to generate the, the transcripts. Also, I heard yesterday you had a class about reinforcement learning. Um, I'm not an expert at all about reinforcement learning. I barely know some basic stuff, but you can also use a, this casual transformer would be a transformer decoder. Um, so the same way we do language modeling to predict the next word, you can train this model uh, to predict the next action. So you feed the state, the action, and whatever is deserved, that I don't know. <laughs> and, and it predicts the next actions uh, to take by the agent, okay? And again, this can be done with a transformer. This is called decision transformer. And here we have a, an animation on how it does uh, it. In this case, it's playing uh, this video game. And this, these decisions can be taken by a, by a transformer. GitHub Copilot, and before we were mentioning about code completion, um, so what is behind this, I don't know if anyone hasn't heard about GitHub Copilot, is this service that helps you in, in code compl completion in a super crazy way, like you don't even have to program at all if you don't want. Well, obviously there can be errors, um, but it, it works uh, quite impressively. Um, 
And what is behind uh, GitHub Copilot is this paper, <coughs> which is by OpenAI, and it's the, mo the model name is, is Codex. So Codex is a, a large language model that has been trained instead of the whole internet, the whole GitHub. So, so they downloaded all the code in GitHub uh, and they trained a, a language model to predict the next token um, by, by generating code. Um, so you can get super crazy examples. You won't see it now, but the thing is that you can, for example, you can just define uh, the name of the function, uh, doc string defining what the, the function has to do, and basically Codex or GitHub Copilot figures out what is the code that needs to generate, okay? And the good thing is that now you know what is behind this. It's a transformer decoder, like the ones we saw uh, that do language modeling, but just trained on code on the whole GitHub. Okay. Here are some examples, the ones that you were mentioning before. Uh, you won't see them now, but basically here they generate a super basic video game uh, about, uh, yeah, about something about the space but just interacting with the model with natural language. So add this image of a rocket ship and it gives a link. So it generates a code in JavaScript, I think, to generate, uh, to, to download this image. And then it starts asking for other things. Make it be small. It generates a code and the code makes this small. And this way, interacting with the model uh, with natural language, it's able to generate all this code and end up with a with a qu quite nice uh, video game. So, oops, maybe too far. So you see, it's now playing this video game and has generated all the code with with uh, natural language. And here we have this example uh, that they do general data science with with Codex. Um, I think they download some data. Uh, but again, interacting with natural language and generating the, the code automatically. And they, they end up with, um, with some visualizations. Oops, sorry. Well, you can watch it uh, if you have time. Also, um, I don't know if there is someone with some um, biomedical background. I don't have any. I barely know how, how proteins work. But I knew that this paper from DeepMind uh, had a huge impact in the scientific community uh, because they basically solved the problem that has been uh, there for so many years and solved, which is uh, protein folding prediction. It's this task where you have the whole sequence of proteins. I think they are amino acids, maybe. You know the amino acid you have at each position, but you don't know which is the structure of the protein. So knowing how this protein is folded and, and which is its structure can help you to, I don't know, do things with these proteins and understand better how they work. But the thing is that until this paper came, it was super difficult. I mean, it's super difficult to process a protein and see exactly which is its structure. It's it's there's a lot of cost on, on this, <laughs> and and predicting it from the sequence it, it it was it was impossible for. But they trained this model uh, called AlphaFold, where they basically solved this task and um. And this has, as I was saying, this had a, a huge impact in the scientific community beyond uh, AI community. I mean, so scientifics doing typical scientific things um, related to biomedical stuff and these things. Um, so again, um, there are many things here that I don't understand, but what I can assure you is that this block here is called Evoformer, and we checked, and at the end, this is a, a modification of the transformer for this specific task they are training here, okay? So even in, in a so unrelated thing as protein folding, there are all, also these ideas uh, that came with a transformer that are also applied there. And finally, the last example, and this is my favorite example, uh, and not because the name, the name is Gato, which is cat in Spanish. Um, this is a quite impressive model. This is multimodal. And what does it mean? It means that we are doing basically the same that we've been seeing now. So we have a transformer decoder that tries to predict the next word, but now it's not just a word. So the same model, it's able to do this next time step prediction, let's say, 
with different modalities. So we can model um, how to play uh, video games. We can model text to try to predict the next words. We can model um, <clears throat> arm, uh, robot arms, uh, how to move them. We can also do uh, image question answering where, where we give an image and ask some questions about the image and the model is able to, to answer it. So the cool thing is that until this point, we've been developing models that are really narrow in specific tasks. And this was the first uh, model uh, with a quite decent performance in a wide variety of tasks. I, in, in principle, really unrelated. So I think this is a, a great approach uh, to face uh, the future of AI, especially if we want to focus on, on AGI, artificial general intelligence, because this way, a single model can learn how to mix knowledge from different tasks. So imagine that, I don't know, what the model has learned here uh, by processing text may be useful on how to move robotic arms. I think this is something closer to what we humans do. So we, we don't learn in a, in a unimodal way. We not just learn by just um, reading text, for example, as GPT-3 does. We, we see things, we watch movies, uh, we go to conferences, and this is multimodal knowledge that we get. And these kind of models, I mean, this is not even closer, close to, no. to AGI. But this seems like a good approach on having a single model that is able to process different kinds of data and that internally can learn how to process different knowledge coming from different um, sources. Um, so now the end is near. No, okay. So when you do the training, uh, your the input is always uh, processed in the same manner, the same parameter, so you have different parts of the method that are, let's say, trained to the different tasks. I don't know. Because really, really good question. Um, I, I should check, but I'm pretty sure that it's not. Um, I think they are basically preparing before feeding the model. Uh, so this bad input they have here, they are preparing these inputs to be always seen as the same uh, for the model. So like, to so not have to differentiate between them, I think. Um, so you have a bit processing or the, and then you're structuring the data in a way that you can analyze it. Somehow. Yeah. So the knowledge that you acquire from one task will be shared somehow with the knowledge that you have from another. Exactly. Uh, I understand. This is good. But it would also be uh, failing in the real life if talking about the general artificial intelligence, because of course we know that if I see myself in a situation where I recognize that this type of behavior is appropriate for a certain situation, but this other thing that I have learned is not mm -hmm. is not the right thing to do. So this is probably not possible if it's not so if you if you're sharing everything without discriminating from the situation. I, I'm in a moment where I'm quite uh, aseptic about what will happen with AI the following years. Um, to be honest, G GPT-3 and large language models surprise me a lot. Um, because in general, it's so, it, it seemed that um, models could only learn by, like the, the way we were training neural networks was too narrow and there is no way like to build a, a general AI. But with GPT-3, we saw something impressive uh, with all power, these models that are just trained by predicting the next word. But they learn how to, how to solve other tasks. So it's true that they, at this point, still they may fail in real world because we cannot control them. And this is something that may be a bit dangerous uh, in the sense that it may generate offensive uh, things or whatever, or taking bad decisions. Um, but let's see, I don't know. Uh, in the last year, I was quite surprised of, of the things that we saw. And I think if we, we see more, like if we see this model, for example, scale, uh, we'll be surprised of things that can, that this could be, do, that what could be doing. To me, what is happening here, you have a very powerful engine to model correlation. The modeling correlation in time, space, wherever correlation is appearing, you can capture that efficiently. And uh, and then this capability of modeling correlation makes you 
you know, making decisions or uh, writing that automatically because you're, you're based on the structure that you're learning and you're repeating based on that structure. And in most things, like in the language, I can see that. I can see that successful because it's, it's based for a big percentage of what we do is based on the correlation, which is the structure of the text, uh, you know, the language they use, the grammar. But um, when, when you're talking about reasoning, uh, the capacity of solving a new problem of, uh, I don't know, I don't know, we'll see. But, but that's what we saw with uh, large language models. Part. I mean, currently, <laughs> is, is a huge part of what human beings are, are capable of understanding and extracting from signals from the sensory system. But it is not the only one. I believe there is also some Bayesian learning, Bayesian reason that has to be added. Uh, yeah, let's see. Let's see what happens. Um, let's see what happens. This, this is only correlation real. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, about the original question, you were asking if 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 there is a kind of um, different paths inside the network. Yeah, um, exactly. the, I, I wanted to point out something about Palm. So. Um, Palm is called Palm because it's Pathways language model. So Path language model, Palm. And Pathways is a, a way of working that Google uh, designed, but it's um, defining networks, and in this case, transformers, in a way that they are able to decide by, by themselves how to route information through the network. So we have models with a lot of parameters, but we don't have to pass through all the parameters in the network to do an inference. Okay, because it, it would be like unfeasible to train a, a network with passing through 140 uh, billion parameters. So what they do is um, the network is capable of routing information. So there are there are paths, different paths that you can follow uh, during inference and training, and the network basically, depending on the input, decides where to route information. But this is a mechanism that they they, they, they develop. But at the end, what you have inside are the transformer and encoder layers that we that we learned today. This, this is just something they added to, to be able to scale this and to add many more parameters. And I wanted to explain this because I think that maybe we are not adding explicitly ways to process different modalities, but we are developing models that are capable of routing information in different parts of the, of the model. So it's not the typical model where you pass through all the layers. Um, <coughs> that the model can learn how to mix information in, in different depths of the network. This has to do with the reason, yeah. the discrimination, capability of discriminating what, what to do. Yeah. Right. So that, yeah. that is getting closer to the, yeah. the final goal. You can do this pathways in, uh, without too much resources. Um, I'm just thinking that the, when you have a neural network and I want efficiency, uh, I don't need to use all the neurons. I just want to use a part of the network. And don't care about this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But does this require like a big structure? I mean, big uh, computation to do this? Or? I don't know. I've just seen it in transformer models that try to make uh, to to add more parameters. Um, so normally they added. I think originally they they there is a paper called routing transformer. I think where they were doing it in the feed forward uh, part. They had different feed forwards and the network could choose how to route it and um, check it. Uh, I think it's an interesting read for you. And yeah, maybe you can apply it in a in a um, smaller scale if you, if you, you need. It's something worth exploring, definitely. Um, some other comments? Yeah. So you can have different feature tools in one. One choosing the provider trait and others in the one. Mm -hmm. So it's the, the trait of the um, complexity and peace. No, I, I would say it's a general trend um, because there is no problem at all with uh, unlabeled data. So we live in a world where, where collecting data is quite easy, the difficult part is labeling it. So in general, I see the trend, and it has been like this in computer vision so, for so many years, and in the recent years, it, it has also arrived in, in natural language processing, um, that we pre-trained pre 
networks with with unlabeled data, a lot of unlabeled data, and then use this as a starting point for our own test task. So if you like in computer vision, it's super typical to start with a ResNet uh, trained on ImageNet. So ImageNet is a labeled data set, that's true, but this is huge. This is, was collected uh, so many years ago. And then, for example, you want to, I don't know, you have a very specific use case where you want to classify very specific objects. But instead of training it from scratch, what typically it has been done in, in computer vision is to use one of the ResNets trained on ImageNet to get a good performance on ImageNet and then fine tune it in my own task. So it, since it starts from a good, it has a good starting point, it, it performs really well. It has arrived to NLP and in general, I think this is a trend um, to use some, uh, I mean, if you have a source of data that you can somehow figure out how to train a, ne uh, a network with that, without any labels, that is a, a good starting point. You will fine tune it later. It will, I mean, if, if your amount of data is somehow restricted, it will always perform better if you can pre-train it in a related task, obviously. Um, but if, if you have many unlabeled data, it's totally worth it. I don't know if this answers the question. So in your case, for example, uh, that you told me that you were working with maps images, um, so probably you need a task. Uh, I mean, maybe you need to train a, ne a network to, um, I don't know, do some kind of segmentation on the satellite images or drone images. Um, so if probably you, you can have access to, it's difficult to get access of, of labeled images with the, segment, with the segmentation zone, but probably it's easy to get a lot of images of satellites uh, coming from satellites. So it's a good approach to try to figure out how to do one of these tricks, like the one from BERT uh, that consisted just of masking some words and trying to predict that. So maybe you could mask some regions of the image and then train a network to try to complete that masks because you have that labels because this is in the original image. And then once you have this model that has learned somehow to understand how it works, then you fine tune on your own task where you have uh, a thousand manually leveled uh, images with the, with the segments, which is the cost part of collecting data, leveling the, the segments. Well, was it fine, the example in your field? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, what else? Um, so I go back here. Now the end is near, as thanks another set. Um, this is what we saw. Um, we, we learned about sequence to sequence models. We started with vanilla sequence to sequence. It's just passing a context vector, remember? It was, it seems like yesterday, right? <laughs> then we, we learned about the attention mechanism uh, applied in these sequence to sequence models. And once we had this, we could learn about the transformer detector. And we went deep to the transformer detector, learning everything, all the blocks that are in the main figure of the transformer detector. We saw that it's not just for machine translation and so strict in an encoder decoder architecture that we can just pick the encoder, just pick the decoder, and we saw some applications like BERT, uh, this idea of pre-trained models and then fine tuning them, or of the um, capabilities of large language models. And we and we closed basically seeing that transformers nowadays are, are everywhere. And basically save the same now and save the same now. Uh, also, to close it, uh, there is this super nice uh, library uh, from Hugging Face. I don't know if you know about it. It's called Transformers. Uh, it's, it's a really easy way to, to start working with pre-trained transformer models. So here you see some of the models that we mentioned today. Here you have GPT-2 or BERT is here. Roberta is also here. So you can really easily download them and use them in your own tasks. Um, also, for the ones that care more about efficiency, uh, there are also these models called, called distill BERT. So distill comes from knowledge distillation, and these are kinds of models that reduce the size of BERT uh, but keep the same performance. So if you are interested in this, it's something worth checking. Uh, this distill BERT, there is also distill GPT-2, something to, to check. Anyway, the idea is that you can download it and use really easily. Okay.
And with this, I have a couple of exercises here that if you, this is basically on operating um, scale dot product and then multi head attention on some examples. Uh, you can try it at home if you want. And that's all. Yeah, I end with the presentation. Three guys. No more questions. Yeah, questions? I think maybe last one. I was expecting. Come on. <laughs> no, yeah, I was just thinking of the, well, do you think or do you agree with me that the main drawback is probably that we are training a machine with a human based coded language? So, like language is like a way we use to encode our code, let's say. Uh, and then we're trying to train a machine, which is a totally different thing from us. So, it's like I, I was uh, like reading something that it, they, they were saying that the, uh, intelligence is defined through its limitations. Right? So, so for example, if our day is not as powerful as a machine, that's why we are teaching. Wow, really philosophical. Uh, yeah. The question you yeah, raised here. Um, you're totally right that language, as we define this, uh, it's, it's, a, it's like language is a feature. Yes, right. Yeah, it's, it's in a lower dimension. It seems right, like a down projection of all, yeah. all we have in our minds. We find a way to represent it. And it is efficient for us, maybe. I'm not sure if it is efficient for us, but. Maybe the way to go is multimodal, uh, as the last example we were seeing. Like if, if we don't just focus on language and yeah, because I don't know. Um th this is something somehow related to the work I'm doing in my research. Uh so if you remember from yesterday, um uh, I'm working on speech translation, uh, which is the task translating from speech in one language to text in another language. And we always directly compare with machine translation, which is translating from text to text. And, and we always feel that we are under text to text translation. But then at some point you realize that you can express more with speech yeah. than text. Text is even like you're, you're saying languages. No, we agreed that it's kind of a down projection of our thoughts. Um, but even text is another than projection. So, so our thoughts and how we express them, we even make a even sim simplistic way as as writing text. And with with speech, um, we have more information than text. If what I'm saying now, I was expressing it in text, there is less information you can get. Like if my tone is giving you information here. Um, so yeah, I wanted to to, uh, to raise that because this is something that we sometimes think. That, no, we will always think that we will always perform worse than text to text translation, but maybe it's not right because we have more information. We are processing speech, and we in speech we have more information. It's it's somehow related. Uh, but yeah, this, the, your your question is more philosophical than that. Than that, I, I think the way to go is multimodal. Uh, Multimodal, and also the thing is that um, collecting enough data at the end, you are developing uh, collective uh, intelligence. Like these models that have been trained with the whole internet, it's true that it's a down projection of human knowledge because it's just what it's written in text, but it's it's picking information from knowledge from the whole world. So Maybe this compensates a bit. Yeah, but it's going down to what I was saying before. There is a difference between being very capable of modeling correlation and grasping information, representing that efficiently internally, and uh, producing new knowledge and new information. This is doing it, but out of a correlation model. And, and we are saying, OK, maybe correlation is all we are, right? The, this is my favorite. My favorite debate nowadays, to be honest. I mean, I think one day I read a tweet. We are, yeah. we are always thinking that that a machine will never reach our intelligence. But 
sometimes, uh, some, some weeks ago, I read someone saying, maybe we are more simple than what we think. Yeah. Maybe we are just language model, multimodal language models that learn how to maybe, yes, and now predict the next <laughs> thing. And this is how we reason. So it's not making machines closer to us. Maybe we need to, to think that maybe we're closer to machines than maybe. what we think. Yeah. This is, I mean, not an expert in the topic. This is something that I read some weeks ago. <laughs> but it was like, okay, maybe maybe this is true. Um, so maybe we are kind of gato evolved yeah. a lot. A lot. Because and and some and also something super cool that we have is that we we are trained permanently. This not normally this, I mean, some of you were working on continual learning, I think. Mm -hmm. I heard something. Um yeah. but no, that's the thing that um we normally train these models and we forget about the training stage and we start applying them. And we are maybe machines that that do this language modeling, but that the good thing is that we can do it continuously. Every time. Every time. Yeah, probably the, I, I believe the co we, the correlation part is there for the to create an yeah, right? yeah. It is not enough. But but this this path selection that you mentioned is getting close. To creating some uh, discrimination, and at the end, the, sometimes people, yeah, but these machines uh, expose biases. Okay, I, I'm. It's totally right. We have to try to reduce these biases because these biases that these machines uh, expose will end up influence, like yeah, influencing our world. So we we need to reduce these biases. But at the end, how they learn these biases. Um, we all have biases also. Why? Because we, we based on these correlations permanently. And and we need to to try to reduce our biases for ourselves and for the machines. Again, maybe we are not so far away from machines in this sense. Uh, no. <laughs>